It's amazing that Tuvix is the one <laughs> that everybody is commenting on. Right. Because well, because everybody has an opinion, and it's and I think everybody has an opinion because this is one of the few times where Star Trek actually landed on an issue, and so people are saying like it, they're they were either right to do so or they weren't. Well, and it's not metaphor either or allegory. It's its own thing. Right. right. If you think about it, right? Like, there's no there's no situation where this would matter. Mm -hmm. in real life See, or not matter but exist right well and it's it's just so interesting to me where like there's some people who are commenting how um they were they were never dead because they were able to be returned and it's like well no people die and then are revived because of technology like you can't say that person didn't die because they're here now like they died they were just revived well um, and also another person didn't spring out of nothing when that person died, <laughs> right? That, right. <laughs> that's what furthers the dilemma a little bit. Right. Well, yeah. and so I, I go to children. Like, this is basically an offspring of Tuvok and Neelix. And I mean, I'm almost by definition by that term, offspring, like I would think so. But, yeah. and so they're saying, like, we have to kill the child to bring the parents back. And it's so weird to me that people are saying, like, how do you not understand it? Like, that's the most obvious thing. You kill one to get two. And it's like, the, this person has been alive for weeks, I think, when it happens. And it's maybe a real months. person. Yeah, it's a real person, too. Yeah. It's, not, it's not some weird, it's not like, what was his name? Doll? Well, Mal? Lol. Uh, Lol. Yeah. Lol. Yeah. Lol. Lol. <laughs> Doesn't Lols. work anymore. I know. <laughs> I mean, Data keeps cloning her just because he does it for the lols. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like, it it is a very short amount of time that this thing has been alive and i think the best the the two the two ones where it kind of one either way you're going to weaken the position but one said like immediately put him in stasis so until you find a cure because it it is an anomaly and so you would want to put it in a stasis chamber until you figured out how to solve the anomaly or have it be that the uh, the hybrid mutation did not work and so he was dying anyway that's the best way to get out of the dilemma mm -hmm. that's the best way to make it easier an easier decision right but that's less interesting oh yeah totally totally and i i don't actually i haven't seen the episode in a while so i don't know what the conversations were and what what was their explanation was to tuvix as to why they were going to murder him uh, and, <laughs> i mean basically said we're bringing tuvok and neelix back and he was like don't i have a say in it and they're like eh, eh, no meh. right <laughs> yeah. Do Tuvok and Neelix have a say in it? Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, everybody thinks that because there's two people that one is expendable. Mm -hmm. And I sort of was making the, the judgment. Well, we're not, it's not as though, it's not the train metaphor or the train dilemma. What's it called? The train, the trolley. I mean, a thought experiment. It's not as though you were going to either save Tuvix from certain death or save Neelix and Tuvok from that. Like Tuvix was fine. He didn't need saving at the time. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So you're, it's, that doesn't apply to me. Right. But I can understand you're saying, well, you're sacrificing one to get two. So the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The, uh, Tuvok the needs and of Neelix, the one more outweigh the needs of the one. <laughs> they didn't have any needs. They were dead. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess they have a need to live. I, I think it was more that Janeway at all had a need for them to live, mm -hmm. which yeah, doesn't I mean, apply to mm -hmm. what Spock meant at all. Right. No, not even a little bit. And I do think that is a valid argument to, um, to the position of sacrificing Tuvix or yeah, Tuvix uh, is that they are in the Delta Quadrant and they need every crew member in the positions that they have, you know, they, they yeah, need, yeah. they need the security guard. They need the cook. They need the ensign. Well, no, they don't need a cook because they have <laughs> things called replicators that do a perfectly fine job. Right, right. But remember like those, those draw power and they need that power to keep replicating shuttles. Do they, <laughs> do they need it? It's unclear or, if they actually need the power because right. they seem to be doing just fine after the beginning at the beginning of each episode. Right. But but my point is that oh, Brian Fuller. It's it's Sorry. a sli it's a slippery slope because so are we saying that so anyone who is better at the science station 
is less expendable than just some ensign. Oh, there's only one ensign and he's not expendable. <laughs> but any subordinate. So we can just start killing subordinates if it means saving higher ranking people. Is that what that means? That's kind of the implication. I don't think that works for me. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I, I feel like I if that started happening, I think you'd have a, a mutiny fairly quickly. Right, beyond just the Maquis saying, we don't want to work for Starfleet. But I think <laughs> willingly sacrificing yourself so someone else can, not even, no, not willingly, <laughs> coercively <laughs> sacrificing right. yourself so a higher ranking officer can keep their job uh, is not part of the, the protocol in Starfleet. Well, and it's unclear that just because Tuvok was no longer there at the science station, that the ship would have immediately just careened into a sun and died, right? Like, I'm pretty sure there was somebody else who could have gotten the job done. Maybe Tuvix, maybe he could have learned a few things. Since they, I think they, I think Tuvix had the cumulative. Yes. Um, yeah, he, he, was in, yeah he was in love with Kess, but he knew that he had a wife back home on Vulcan. So this, I, I think that would have been fine. <laughs> this, this new three week old is in love with a three year old and has a 170 year old wife back on Vulcan. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people agreed with us that it would have been interesting, if not temporarily to have him on the show, a la Pulowski, Panowski to Wazowski. Just, that's what it is. Wazowski. I love the matrix. There it was good. Um, <laughs> This episode, this single episode, has this much divisiveness on it. Imagine if it had been like a five, six episode arc and they ended it the same way where they were just like, oh, hey, Tuvok and Neelix are back. You're dead. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it, it could have gotten really deep and really dark very quickly because you could have had one portion of the crew who was against Mm -hmm. killing Tuvix and another portion. So then you have this, this rumble of mutiny saying like, whoa, we're not, we're not cool with this. Yeah. We like Tuvok. Actually, no, we don't. Tuvok was not liked (laughs) on the, on the ship, on the ship at all. So you want to bring back somebody who was pretty much mostly disliked on the ship. uh, Well, that's the thing. Both of them were, were kind of grating for the complete opposite reason. You know, Tuvok was condescending and Neelix was everybody's, tried to be everybody's best friend. And so right. they they made Tuvix, who was literally the best of both worlds. Like he was sympathetic, but he had the logic behind it. Right. And everybody loved Tuvix. So, so yeah, like <laughs> this definitely could have caused some very mutinous behavior. And it's just crazy that he was so beloved. And at the end of the episode, nobody did anything. Like I remember just being floored that there was no one except the doctor basically saying like, I cannot do this. Right. Yeah. And so the Janeway had to do it. That's yeah. Right. And she should have. Right. Honestly. What if Janeway fell in love with Tuvix? <laughs> or at least a holodeck version of him. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you could just over the course of six episodes or something like that, you, you could go really far with that character. Right. And that's not something that's really happened before, at least in the old, che- old Trek where mm-hmm. it's not, like a long-standing serialized plot line, but there's this interjected new character that is that everyone's having to get used to. And you're kind of like, they can still have other plot lines. It wouldn't have to always be about Tuvix. And a lot of people invoked the whole Riker thing. It's like, well, it happened, so you can do it, right? So why not do the Riker thing? Like, yeah. like split up. But then you're still killing somebody, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have another one. You got a backup. Right. But uh, you're still, it's not, because... Uh, Riker, it wasn't like he was just this drone that was asleep until they found him. Like he mm-hmm. lived his own life. It's a new being. You just keep creating new beings <laughs> to kill, you know? Right. And so it wouldn't necessarily work to do it that way either because the moral the moral problem is not erased with the whole Riker thing. Right. What's his name? William and Thomas. Steve? <laughs> oh, I like Steve better. Steve well, and Riker. Somebody commented too, like... uh they said when Will Riker was on the on Deep Space Nine, you know, which we've seen, we have, yeah, yeah, but it that. wasn't Will. Yep. Like that was the that was the point I was getting to. Right. You know, like yeah, they they, they remember the episode, but they couldn't get the character right, which they should be on our show. Right. <laughs> Speaking of our show, as you know, <laughs> uh, who's starting? Me? You? Yeah. Well, you start. Uh, all right. Well, episode. this is a measure of an episode where it is our continuing mission to explore what makes Star Trek proper. Star Trek. And 
Not, I had one. Dang it. Uh, How about Saturday morning cartoons? <laughs> Ye- Do they still yeah. have Saturday morning cartoons? Oh, that's what it was. And not just, no, they don't. Uh, that actually ended um, about f- six years ago. The last Saturday morning, like the last. Really? Yeah, specifically Saturday morning cartoons ended. Um, about seven years ago, like the last programming for Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, and not just a retcon that's not entirely a retcon. I'm Jonathan. Oh, and I'm Paul. And the criteria by which we judge these episodes, number one, is there science fiction inherent to the plot? Number two, is that science fiction unique or novel in some way? And number three, is there a moral or ethical dilemma like Tuvix? <laughs> I'm Paul. And I'm Jonathan. And did you do a blurb? I did. And this week, we watched Lower Decks, season four, episode four, Something Borrowed, Something Green. See what they did there? Mm. The blurb says, tell me a salmon back to Orion for a wedding. I'm not sure where the punctuation goes there. I think if we fed it into chat GPT, we'd get some very interesting results. Tell me a salmon back to Orion for a wedding. <laughs> tell, common, me... A salmon. So you're telling yourself to tell a salmon. Back to, yeah, it doesn't work. There's nothing. There's, it, we're missing something. <laughs> if there was a go in there. Well, no, you can put quotes around back to Orion for a wedding. I mean, that's kind of a cop out. But Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, what is this, Picard? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Tendi is summoned back to Orion for a wedding. <laughs> right, it's, right. Oh, you figured it out. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, I know. Yeah. Took a little parsing out and <laughs> sleuthing, but So how is this a retcon? In the original series, Orion the the Orion women were slaves. And that was just kind of how it worked. And the the Orion men were the pirate side. In Enterprise, they did a reversal and made it reverse sexism by having the women produce pheromones which made the men their slaves and they were they were the like subversive pirates pretending to be the slaves so nobody would pay attention to them. Got it. They were obviously leaning into the matriarchal side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not, or I didn't remember the, the Enterprise episode or the original series episode, mostly because I haven't seen them. <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> yeah. But it makes sense because they were, they were trying to make it that way. You know, mm-hmm. they were certainly subjugating men in mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I found this episode to be not very interesting. Um, it felt disingenuous. It felt like the moral of the story on both sides, both for Boimler and Rutherford and for Tendi and the other two, <laughs> Mariner and the other one. Right. T- um, t- it felt like, you know, t- the, t- the moral was honesty is best. Mm-hmm. And a friendship. If you want to get to know your friends, be honest with them. Yeah. And I felt like maybe that works. Maybe you could go down that road in season one, episode two, right? But they've been together now for four seasons, four and a half seasons now. I feel like exploring this side of the relationship is not very interesting because they've been to, they know each other. They're they are right. Well, yeah, so, like kind of kind of right off the bat, they they leaned into the trope of roommates and. It was still just a trope, like where on the surface, everything is great until they hit a breaking point. Now, the, I guess the thing that was a little different was that was the only breaking point. They weren't like, and you do this, and you do this. Like, it was just the bonsai tree. But yeah. but still, like, it got under my skin that they were best friends until they weren't. And, like, it took them, it took them not only... Like where they at each other's throats, but it took them so long to come to the compromise of you do the evens, I do the odds. Right. Yeah. It just it felt very shallow to mm-hmm. me, the whole thing, and if, like, the interpersonal stuff with Tendi and at all was not particularly interesting either. Even the stuff with her sister was there was a confrontation and it was resolved in the two and a half minute fight scene. Mm-hmm. I did. And I just didn't care. Uh, sorry. You know? <laughs> I did like though that Tendi was like, wait, you. Faked your own kidnapping just to bring me here so you could tell me you didn't 
like you were mad at me for abandoning you? And she's like, it's not always about you. And then while they're fighting, she's like, I did it because you wouldn't have come to the wedding and I wanted you to know. Like, and she says exactly what Tendi said. Right. Yeah. And it, it just, I mean, it was funny, but I, I felt like what an opportunity, uh, excuse me. Whoa. What an opportunity. I almost died. What an opportunity to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to explore the same exact reason of why Mariner wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Was that you? And it kind of just turned into this kind of nightclubby, horny thing. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like I was expecting there to be this thing because it was this planet, this culture that nobody knows anything about, which they they kind of seeded, but it came out of nowhere with this payoff. And it wasn't really a payoff; it was more of just a we're going to follow Tendi around into the seedy nightclubs of right. Orion. To me, it felt very light on science fiction and very light on Star Trek in general, yep. other than the reference of, oh, these are the Orions, et cetera. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. This was, yeah. um, it was a character episode and, you know, kind of like what you were talking about in the last one where like, because these characters establ- are established, we don't have to spend all this time to meet them. But this was a season, like, this was a season one episode where, like, they're kind of just becoming friends and getting to know each other. This was not a season four episode where they've had these discussions before. Yeah, and you can do this. You can do this type of episode, but the conflict has to be something a little bit more deep than be honest with your friends. Your friends will love you no matter what you say. Right. Tendi has always been very tight-lipped about her Orion background, and this was a nice episode to expose that. It was just obnoxious that she waited until the end to come clean with her friends. Yeah. You know, like she basically when they got to the planet, she could have been like, look guys, I was trying to hide this from you. There's no way I'm going to be able to now. Here's my life. Yeah. yeah. And make it um, ditch the Rutherford Boimler plot entirely. We learned nothing from it. Nothing happened. We are no farther along than we were when we, since the last episode, right? So ditch it and have go a little bit deeper into this Orion. Have her be a more of a have the exploration be more of an adventure of this really interesting life that she led before she came to Star Trek. <laughs> but I actually kind of I, I I didn't like the end given that they had already resolved their conflict. Uh, but I did like that the the junior grade. Uh, officers like offered a solution that was dumb and didn't work uh, you know yeah. like it it was a nice subversion of the people being like oh here's something that we were doing that directly relates to what the conflict is like why don't we try it and it happens to work like i did like that it didn't work what should have happened is that they could not like maybe they d- agreed on odds and evens and then one of them just really wanted to miss and so like they did it on the wrong day and so the conflict stays and like that bonsai is basically the thing that's tearing them apart and then it gets eaten and they both like mourn the loss of their bonsai tree oh that's smart yeah i mean you could have they could immediately become friends again once they eat yeah. the bonsai tree yeah. Right. The thing that was tearing us apart is no longer here. Like we can be friends again. Yay. <laughs> I feel like the tacit joke of that whole plot line is something we didn't see that happened off screen is how they convinced that gigantic warrior <laughs> to get into the outfit with the wig right. and sit there in the holodeck. Like what, how long did it take them? And what yeah. did they say to get him to do that? <laughs> right. 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 I mean, they they very briefly touched on it, saying, "I appreciate you coming over here for this talk." But but yeah, like, well, because he was like, resolute in not allowing them to do anything mm-hmm. with Cerritos, and so what did they it turns say? Out he was just hangry, right? What did they say? Yeah, <laughs> we have to do that. Uh, it's hilarious to me because he's just sitting there and like he's like bulging out of the costume, uh-huh. and he's oh, got a totally. white right. wig that he doesn't like, but he he's he's wearing it anyway. <laughs> Well, and again, I mean, it w- it seems like it was intentionally condescending because I assume, and we've assumed before that, well, they've, they've even said like the clothes are replicated, which means they should have fit perfectly. And maybe they didn't have time you know, to scan <laughs> and they just had to, th- who's the biggest guy, you know? Right. So it's Shax's outfit. Right. And obviously the whole Mark Twain thing, that's a reference to next gen too. Oh, totally. Yeah. Which is, I love those kinds of references where they don't mention it as a reference. They're Mm -hmm. just in the same world as what had happened before. 
And that's right. cool. I like that kind of reference, whereas as opposed to Picard when they have to play music and tell you with <laughs> subtitles on the screen what's happening to all of the people, right? Like either right. you're going to get it or you're not. And so we don't, mm-hmm. we don't need to tell the people who already got it what it is. And we don't need to tell the people who won't get the reference what it is, right? Right, yeah. Apparently your phone thinks that's the right yeah. idea too. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, just to go down that tangent just for a second – it's exactly that. Like if it, if it doesn't impact your understanding of the episode, don't talk about it. Yeah. Like if you don't know what that is, you're just like, what, why are they dressing up as Mark Twain? That's hilarious. Like it's just a random thing. Right. And they're, they're which speaking, is what Lower Decks is all about. Although I did miss the way that Mark Twain spoke in the next gen episode. Like he basically sounded like Skeletor. <laughs> like, oh, and right. you did a great <laughs> impression of him. I can't even remember what it was, but I know that I laughed for 15 minutes after you did it. Do you remember what he sounded like? Yeah, I mean, it's Skeletor, and I remember the voice. I just don't remember, you know, oh, like <laughs> he was like, um, I am but a crumb <laughs> on the biscuit of your wit. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me this. So there's a point where they go into the bar um, Tendi at all go into the bar and they, they meet in Greta who mm-hmm. must have been channeling Ursula. Right. Yeah. I, right. Or I mean, some kind of burlesque cause, um, Ursula is based off of divine, I think is her name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, some kind of burlesque drag performance. It just felt like that was the note. This is a play Ursula, oh, yeah. right? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Right, yeah, probably. I mean, it's an easy easy note to completely understand what you're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, you get it immediately, right? Right. By the way, I was expecting Melissa McCarthy to just sort of do a Melissa McCarthy SNL job on playing Ursula in the new Little Mermaid, which I haven't seen, by the way. I only looked up her doing the song. Okay. And she does a great job. Like, she does yeah. just as good of a job as the original, whose name I cannot remember. But... Just as much charm and sass and wit added to it, but different. Mm-hmm. It wasn't mm-hmm. a, an impersonation of the original Ursula, but I thought she did a great job. I was very impressed. Like, she should just do that from now on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted, like, talking about that for a moment. I don't know whether or not it's going to be a stay in the episode, but um, I, I'm so irritated they, they took out the sexist part in the song because it's the villain, and we could have had Ariel just be like that's not how they are um right. well you, know, you mean or, wh- which sexist part you got your good uh, looks, yeah your you got your looks face, your pretty face yep yeah and the the part that i did like that they changed though to like kind of take out that continuity error is instead of signing it she says take a scale from off your tail and toss it here into the bowl right and like th- that's the agreement yeah why do they change that well because if she can write then when she goes to see Eric, like, why not just write him a note saying what's happened? That's a good plan. That's a good point. Very solid point. Yeah. Although if like, why, why go through all of this trouble? Why not just put it in the fine print that in fact, she's just signing away her soul immediately. <laughs> and she didn't read it. So most of them don't read it. So right. just put it in there. And then when she signs, you can just put her in the hole and then you've done what you needed to do. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like you will, <laughs> you will lose all ways to communicate. No talking, no writing, no signing. <laughs> <laughs> no charades. Right. So getting back to Lower Decks, I think I figured out what my favorite part of Lower Decks is. This episode or Lower Decks? Lower Decks. Okay. Um, I know I had one of these yesterday or yesterday, last time. I mean, that was just like 40 minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I love the exteriors of the ships, all the space stuff, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Uh, I think it looks so cool. It makes me wish that the whole show looked like that, but the exteriors are obviously all computer generated three dimensional, but Mm -hmm. the content of the show for the most part is 2d animation where everything is very flat lighting. You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's as if they have a spotlight on everywhere. You know, there's no shadows except in certain situations where there it's like dark and they have some shading on them. But for the most part, it's just this bright thing, right? But whenever they Mm -hmm. cut to the exteriors, it just feels like a different show immediately. Almost to the point where it kind of takes you out of it. It's almost like, oh, damn it. Like when they cut mm-hmm. inside, it's like, oh, I thought it was going to look like that on the inside too. But it doesn't. And I wish that there was some 
gap to bridge or they could, well, no, no. I wish they could bridge that gap somehow. Mm-hmm. Eh, I kind of like some gap to bridge. <laughs> kind of nice. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. Do you, do you notice it? Do you notice like the exterior are oh, like totally. super cool looking? Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is very much a 3d. That's just my, you know, that's just, I, there's nothing to say about that. I just, I just noticed it in this one where it just looks so good and they're doing more of it. It feels like maybe that's, that's just me not knowing the show well enough, but it feels like we're outside of the ship a lot more and they're getting better at it. Right. I th- well, I think it's possible just because we are now dealing with characters who are doing more things outside of the ship. Right. And so we don't have to have those same establishing shots of the Ritos. You, listening to you talk about the, the 3D animations made me think about the cold open with the Orion ship. And we've had it at the beginning. We've had it at the end. This one would have been fun since we were already on Orion if they if they had it cut in the middle like there's suddenly this orion pirate ship you know and we're like oh what's going on and then we see the other shuttle and they just blast them out of the sky and that's the end of it yeah. you know kind of the same thing like just a a random you know cut scene uh of them being destroyed and us kind of being reminded without it being the same cold open the ship being destroyed you know, like it's, but it kind of is the same. I mean, it's, oh yeah. But know. just placed in a different spot would right. make us wonder like why this ship is important and then see the other one and go, oh, okay. They're just being blasted. You know, it, it just would have caused a different feeling. I'm waiting for them to encounter whatever this mystery ship is for them to encounter the Borg. Because mm. that seems like the most obvious, they, they seem to be encountered. They seem, they seem to be using all of the enemies or just bad guys in general to destroy I guess Klingons aren't really that necessarily, but it seems like they're, they haven't encountered a lot of Starfleet, right? To blow up. Not yet, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I want to see them battle the Borg. If this is just one of these right. invincible ships, I want to see it. Yeah. Well, I mean, don't call it battle because it's not going to be a battle. <laughs> well, it might be. I mean, the, the Borg are super powerful. And right. you could argue more powerful than any of the ships that they've encountered so far. What I noticed with this one, and I don't know if it's happened before, was when the light blasted through, the body stayed for a moment before, like, it became particleized as well. Yeah. And I thought that was weird. Like, given the power of that blast, there is no way that any of her would have stayed there. <laughs> well, it's unclear what's happening to them. They're not just exploding. I guess that's true. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're dismantling the ship molecularly, I guess, but it's not... A- photon torpedo it's not a phaser where normally you would just see a big fireball right it seems to be something else so maybe that has something to do with it i have a feeling it's gonna play into it and when we find out what it is it's gonna be some as maybe as you predicted the what's it peanut butter meatball (laughs) (laughs) your peanut butter hamper okay um so maybe i hope so i hope that's there there that this pays off really well because i'm starting to get a little bit bored with it it's the same thing over and over like we're not learning anything new each time right well yeah and that was kind of my point other than it's not discriminatory yet right or other than it seems to be following the cerritos in some way i don't know like Mm. i don't think it was a it it wasn't a coincidence that (laughs) kazoon tight it wasn't a coincidence that this mystery ship blew up an orion pirate ship on this episode maybe i mean has there been any connection before this there was romulan there was klingon what was the other one it was a romulan klingon is that it that's it okay is that it in the third one there wasn't anything so you're right yeah so anyway i'm i was wondering if there was some if it was thought being followed if there was some connection but i can't think of one i'm sure Mm -hmm. somebody's smarter than us some fans (laughs) out there (laughs) some star trek fans have already figured that out but I want, I'm waiting for some new information. If you're going to keep doing this, you know, if you're just going to keep tagging us along, I understand, but you know, give us something, give us something new. Maybe there's a decal that we missed or something like that. That is indicative of what's going on. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I think that they are still keeping it a mystery. I don't think we're going to find out until the ninth, maybe 10th episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I think, I, I hope that they do give us more after the next episode. I, th- I think that the first four episodes should just tease this and then it'll do something different in the next four episodes and then it'll finally confront with the Cerritos. Well, I want to know. They've got, I mean, they've got me, you know, but they're losing their grip a little bit because I kind of feel like they're, I don't want to be jerked around. I don't like being jerked around. Mm-hmm. 
I don't think I don't think we're being jerked around, but I think that we are. They're they're just establishing the hell out of it. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, being jerked around is lost, where they set up all these huge <laughs> questions. That's true. I'm definitely not as angry as I still am about lost. Right. Should we go uh, we talk about that for a while? I know we always can. Um, but just speaking of like memorable lines and moments, uh, the the line in this episode, which is kind of like one of those things. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast or not, but I was driving down the freeway one time and I was just thinking about home security, and I was like, Sherlock Holmes. <gasps> Oh my God, that's way too clever. There's no way I'm the first person to have ever come up with that. And I looked it up and there were like dozens of different (laughs) home security window replacement, like called Sherlock Holmes. Some of them, you know, spelled literally Sherlock Holmes. Some of them like taking some of the words. So, uh, so there was a line that Tendi said where it was the first time I'm pretty sure that I've heard it, but I was like, that's way too clever for this to be the only time in writing history where this has come up, where um, the, the friend was like, I think you've lost your touch or I don't think you're supposed to be here or something like that. And Tendi says, I don't care about what you think I want to know, or I I only care about what you know. And I was like, that's such a good dismissive line of like, I'm not here for conversation. Just give me the information. Yeah. 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 And she was right. Well, it it also points to, Hey, we would like to see more of Tendi and what her life was like before she joined Star Trek, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice if like maybe she and her sister have to team up in a later episode. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Man, I gotta say, like, Star Trek is kind of doubling down on ninjas. <laughs> right? <laughs> or samurai with yeah, Worf. Or just people yeah. who jump into the air and have sam- and have <laughs> katana. Right. Yeah. And the more hand to hand action combat. Yeah, it just yeah. occurred to me. Um, but I will say that she had two kind of interesting lines at the end where she's talking to Rutherford. Yeah, so Boimler says, we were talking about the Enterprise D. They, they say that word two or three times. And she just says, well, why don't you just use honesty? So she has two bangers in the episode. Right? Yeah. Um, and then the the other part too, the other moment of dialogue where I just thought it was great was where uh, they're saying who wants to steal a ship or something like that. <laughs> and the Vulcan was <laughs> like, I definitely do not. And, and Mariner's just like, oh, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> We're in. <laughs> I also like, liked Mariner when the fourth or fifth knife that gets put drawn in the whatever is she's like, ha ha. Nope. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Although we knew it was going to happen. We knew it was yeah. coming, you know, but again, like it's one of those things where yes, it's a throwaway joke, but typically with lower decks, like there is a reason that knives were drawn to her to that spot, you know? Uh, and so I wonder if it, if it is just a running gag or if there is going to be some kind of payoff where it turns out that she has something in her shoulder. And why didn't they have like a device that like healed it? Like they have in every single next gen episode where they have right. a little device that heals a cut, you know, mm-hmm. by the way, does it just seal the skin and leaves whatever damage happened on the inside or is it repairing everything? It, it repairs everything. I think it goes from the, uh, from the inside out. Right. And what is it doing? Is it like stimulating it, something or is it? Beaming? Yeah. It's is based. It, We should just end the episode there. (laughs) (laughs) We we were both obstinate in our silence. Right. I'm not going to say something. (laughs) Clearly, whatever you have to say is more important than what I'm saying. Exactly. Uh, Well, I mean, you were speculating and so was I, but you were offering options and I was going to say what I think it is. Oh, okay. Well, what do you think it is? I think it's genuine cell regeneration. Like it's just speeding up the the body's healing process. Seems like a good way to get cancer. Like I wonder <laughs> the more you use that thing, the more incidence of cancer you get. I don't think they have cancer anymore. Oh. Uh so yeah, I'm kind of I don't I don't really care that much about this episode other than the stuff we talked about, I guess. Mm-hmm. Except for the little mermaid stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean uh yeah, there's there's not really any sci-fi to the plot. <laughs> Lunch time. Apparently I'm right. Lunch time. Sorry, what did you say? There's no science to the plot? No, there's nothing. I mean, the there's most n- fun thing n- most fun thing that they did was hijack or hotwire the ship that worked magically. I guess it didn't work that long, but 
they right, but they did, didn't say anything about it. They just said, you know, like who who wants to? I, I think they briefly commented on it, just saying what they were going to do. Right. I mean, I think in a real Star Trek, I don't want to say real, but in a live action Star Trek show, that would have been half the episode of them getting it working. You know. Right. Well, in a proper Star Trek episode, that is that that would have checked off that criteria. Right. Leave him out of this. Spent more time exploring. Right. I agree. I agree. Like. <laughs> That should be that. That's true. That would that would have probably put it over the, the line. If it was interesting, you know. Because mm-hmm. you say check off every single goddamn episode, and I I have to bite my tongue. But I couldn't. I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, and uh, there, I, I guess the not even a moral dilemma was just Tendy, not being honest with her friends through the whole episode. You know, because we. Uh, I don't know. Again, I don't know why Lower Decks is doing this. Like, it just, why are they spoon feeding us? Other than the fact that it's animation and they kind of feel like, I don't know, every every cartoon should have some kind of more or less an explicitly stated or something. But, I don't know, but they sure were heavy handed with it on this one. Yeah. It's fine insofar as like, it doesn't ruin the episode, but it's just superfluous. Yeah. It doesn't just, it doesn't go anywhere. It pushes us nowhere. I mean, that's uh, frankly the whatever mystery ship section pushed us further than we, than this entire episode. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a no on the, uh, on the proper Star Trek episode for this one. But a yes on an, on an enjoyable one. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was good. I wanted to hear more about Orion and, her life, Tendi's life and all that stuff. Maybe we will later on, but right. you know. Well, and, and again, kind of the same thing. Like they, uh, they kind of commented on that Mariner and the, the Vulcan, you know, they, they were like, this is stuff that we want to know about. Like, you know, and, uh, and she's writing her report and which, which was another point of contention for me at the end. Like w- when you're doing observations and you're writing out the form, like when the observant, is requesting to modify the information, then it is unethical to submit the report. Like, well, technically, they shouldn't even know about it scientifically. They shouldn't even know they're being observed. Otherwise, their behavior will change. Mm, that's true. That's true. So she shouldn't have done the report to begin with. She should have she, said that. Yeah. Like, she she should have said like this. This report was skewed from the moment you knew that I was making it, and so then Tendy was like, so. <laughs> you're just fucking with me <laughs> indeed they have one of those by the way in every episode where right somebody said one character surprises another one and they're like oh fuck yeah <laughs> they beep it out it's always works yeah. they have one per episode it always makes me laugh or she should have said you know i <laughs> i was to uh, to coin an orion phrase fucking with you <laughs> yeah. all right they, well, but they didn't do that but they didn't do that. Uh, I don't have my phone, so I can't tell you what episode five is. Oh. Episode five is something about Betazoids on the Cerritos causing a up. <laughs> Let's see how close you are. <laughs> do you know it's about Betazoids, or do you just make that up? No, I'm. I, yeah, I do. I do know that much. Okay. All right. Well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They're leaving out half the plot lines now anyway in the blurb, so I know. Yeah. yeah. This this I mean, it's not quite uh Netflix, but it is definitely half hearted. Yeah, it's boring. I mean it's it's accurate. At least it's accurate, you know. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. That's true. Yeah. Oh man, I ran into one of our blurbs or like listening to the episode or something where the blurb says nothing about what happens on the episode there's been a couple like, of those, normally ds9 that those happens on right yeah yeah I, and i think it may have been ds9 i i so wish we'd gotten to that episode where cisco was dating the like the the parasite alien finally he's like oh i'm the captain of this ship i know everyone on board and so like he finds her profile and goes to see her and she has no idea like why he's there and uh, doesn't remember seeing him on the promenade, and it turns out that it's this cloud like trying to meet with Cisco. I forget why, um, you know. And so that's the plot, and the blurb was Cisco takes an evening walk on the promenade. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> which it's not even a plot. Like they thought that was the plot, <laughs> right? Like, 
who thought that that was the that was what was going to happen on this in this forty five minute episode? Yeah. No. Anyway. Anyway. No. I'm, well, I'm sad that those are gone now. Lost of the ages. Well, maybe they'll come back when they bring DS9 back and they reboot it with Alan Menken. With who? Alan Menken, the guy who writes all the Disney songs. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> playing Cisco? <laughs> Alan Menken playing Cisco. <laughs> I'd be fine with that. Yeah. But he has to like try and look like Cisco. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, now it's a much more interesting episode, isn't it? <laughs> and I he has to talk that. like it, but that's not that's not hard to do. You can talk like Cisco. We can talk like Cisco. Yeah. And speaking of talking like Cisco, I've been Paul. I've been Jonathan. And this has been the measure of an episode. But you already knew that. That sounds nothing like Cisco. <laughs>